Okay, so I will introduce Keith and Danny to the first one, and Fred and him to the first one. Okay, yeah, okay. I think they're talking.
Good morning. Good morning. We are, we are very happy to have all of you join us this morning. It's going to be a great morning because this is the morning that uh, uh, that we honor those who have given uh, so much to the community colleges. Also award those individuals uh, and those organizations and campuses that have done some really great things in terms of sustainability. And we also have some other things that we're going to get into. So with that. I'll turn it over to the Chancellor. Thank you, uh, President Baca, members of the board, uh, guests. It's a pleasure again to have all of you here this morning. We're going to begin with uh, two uh, brief award ceremonies this morning, the first of those uh, for our classified employees of the year. And I'm going to ask uh, Member Hawkins and uh, Keith the Mills, the head of the foundation, to please uh, come forward. Good morning. Thank you, uh, President Baca, Chancellor Harris. I'm Danny Hawkins. I am the proud classified employer representative on the Board of Governors, and I'm honored to have you with us today. Thank you for having so many folks here. It's, it's a pleasure. This is our fifth year of Classified School Employees Awards for the Community College, and this is the state uh, identified Classified School Employees Month, which is why May is such a uh, special month for me. I really would be remiss if I did not extend a heartfelt thank you to the foundation and Keith and Mills' support for this program. We're able to award each recipient a $500 check. So without further ado, we'll get started this morning. <laughs> Our first recipient is Kathy Browning from the Los Rios District. Kathy is an information technology assistant too at American River College and has been with uh, the, uh, the college for 14 years. Kathy's work in integrated planning of the ARC, uh, ARC helps faculty and staff make use of program review and educational master plan as instruments for improving academic programs and, and student support services. Kathy is also a founding member of the Way Ministries. This nonprofit organization feeds over 1,200 homeless individuals on a weekly basis. She also organizes the annual Christmas feast that includes donations of, of several crucial items, haircuts, uh, showers, and dinner for underprivileged and homeless population in Sacramento. It's my honor to say, Kathy Browning, please come down and accept your award. Our next recipient is Kathy Chaika from San Mateo Community College District. She is a senior accounting technician at the City College of San Mateo and has been with the district for 29 years. Kathy is highly motivated, competent, dependable employee who cares about the college, her colleagues, and the students at, at both uh, at her campus. In her community, Kathy volunteers with the Boys and Girls Club, Police <coughs> Activities League, and the Pony League. Kathy and her family also take in abandoned and or abused teenagers, providing them with assistance and safe place to stay. My privilege to say, Kathy, please come on down and accept your award. and working with my administration, all the classified staff. I like to thank the Chancellor's Office and the Board of Governors. I do read your emails. You keep us very informed. 
there are numerous changes that go on through the state, and thank you for your fight at the state level. Education is very important to the economy of our whole state. And thank you, and I want to thank my uh, fellow support systems who are here. Uh, education has taken a turn. We're now in technology, and without our support staff IT, my MIS reporting would not get done, because when I get problems, it's like, come fix my machine. <laughs> we need that money. <laughs> so, but thank you. It, it is a pleasure. It is uh, truly an honor. It is really an honor. Our next recipient is Don Ekman from Pasadena Area Community College. Don is a supervisor of facilities services at Pasadena City College and has been with the district for 25 years. Don has made several contributions to the college and takes great pride in the uh, work he does. You can see his work across the campus from maintenance of the renowned mirrored poles in the Child Development Center. He volunteers his time by assisting the construction technology instructors helping to build birdhouses for children in the Child Development Center and welcoming our military men and women home from combat at the airport. Don also is the 2013 recipient of the Community Pasadena City College Reiser Award for Outstanding Support for Education. Don, please come down and accept your award. Well, well, just kidding, I, I just want to offer first-hand testimony that this gentleman is beloved on the Pasadena City College campus. Students, faculty, staff alike in the community really has deep affection for this and it comes from his long service and always willingness to help anybody w who needs assistance on the campus and, and so you, saw, you heard that he was not only recognized by the campus community last year, it's, we're very grateful that he's able to be recognized by the state system as well too. So it's our honor to be able to do this. Thank you very much. I want to thank the board, uh, California Community College Board and Foundation. It's a, a big honor for me. Uh, I really appreciate this. You know, my main focus has always been the students of our campus create an environment that they enjoy uh, and want to come back to. One of the biggest themes that I always hear from the students are, you know, my mom and dad went here, our brother and sister, and so it's, you know, it's important for us in facilities uh, to keep that environment uh, that they want to stay on campus, they want to learn. And uh, again, I thank everyone here for, uh, you know, from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> it's not something that I seek out. Uh, you know, I have a job to do on our campus, and I really enjoy it. Uh, again, thank you all very, very much. And last, but certainly no means least, Rena Fang from the Long Beach Community College District. She is a custodian at Long Beach City College and has been with the district for seven years. She is a trusted employee who takes pride in her job, always goes the extra mile, and works hard to make sure everything runs smoothly at the college. Rena is currently a student at CSU Dominguez Hill who works full-time and still finds time to volunteer for Meals on Wheels and Catered Manor Nursing. Rena, please come on out and get your award. I am very 
humbled um, to be recognized as one of the employee of the year here. I, I wanted to thank the Board of Governors, the Chancellor's Office, the Foundation, my family, my partner, Vice President Emery Gable, Director of Facilities, and uh, World Peace. <laughs> Well, that was my oops this morning. <clears throat> so, our last recipient, and I apologize <laughs> profusely, is one, and I knew I was going to do this when I got up, uh, Patinio from Santa Barbara City College. Juan is a grounds maintenance worker at Santa Barbara City College and has been with the district for 25 years. Juan helps to provide beautiful, safe, and clean environment that serves the backdrop for teaching and learning at the college. He actively participates in the Emergency Preparedness and Safety Marshall Program. His participation in the program is crucial to the safety of the students and the community members at Santa Barbara City College. Juan, please come down and accept your award. <laughs> Center, and it's an honor to be here at the governor's board of governors, uh, chancellor's office of California Community Colleges. And it is a privilege to work at Santa Barbara City College. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Lori, my family, for joining me and uh, seeing uh, me with this award. Thank you very much. Can we have all the recipients please come back? They're going to take a group picture with all of the Board of Governors members. Congratulations. 
for the uh, next award, I'm going to ask uh, Fred Harris to come forward, and also uh, uh, Member Ramos is going to assist him. And these are the uh, Board of Governor Energy and Sustainability Awards. Uh, Fred? Well, good morning, President Baca, uh, members, and uh, Chancellor. Thank you for the opportunity. This is the second annual Board of Governors Awards, and I'm very much uh, pleased to have a variety of people here to be awarded and recognized. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Board Member Ramos, who will do the presentation. Thank you very much, Fred, and good morning, everybody. Uh, today, I am especially proud to announce the winners of the 2013 Board of Governors Energy and Sustainability Award competition. These important awards uh, recognize and reward community college achievements and advancements in energy savings and sustainability practices. Three awards are presented annually to promote ongoing efforts of our assistance community colleges and districts. And the three award categories are as follows. First, a district leadership award. Second, a faculty slash student initiatives award. And third and finally, a facilities and operations award. An additional honorable mention award in each of these categories will be presented in June at the California Higher Education Sustainability Conference that will be convened at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, before we give out the three awards this morning, I would like to indulge you, uh, would indulge me to take a, a minute to recognize some folks um, in the room who have partnered very effectively with the Chancellor's Office and members of this Board of Governors to develop the award framework and to make the annual program possible. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to the following individuals in that category. Matt Sullivan is here. Uh, Matt is uh, an executive at Newcomb Anderson and McCormick. Uh, this uh, important partner assists the California Community Colleges and the Investor-Owned Utilities Partnership that we value so highly uh, with partners including Pacific Gas and Electric, Southern California Gas, Southern California Edison, and San Diego Gas and Electric Company. In addition, Steve Sullivan, no relation, who is the uh, Director of Government and Institutions for Southern California Edison, has been instrumental to this process. Steve, where are you? Thank you so much for your uh, contributions. A uh, couple of his important colleagues are also with him. Um, Dan Tunicuff, uh, who is the Premier Manager of Government and Institutions for uh, Southern California Edison, is here, as well as Lisa Hanneman, who is an Account Manager for the California Community Colleges at SCD. Um, I would also like to acknowledge a couple of other individuals that have been instrumental. I'm not sure if they're with us, but if they are, would you please let us know. Lin Chi Hua from San Diego Gas and Electric. Is Lin Chi here? I'm afraid not. Um, Eddie Alvarado from Pacific Gas and Electric. Is Eddie in the house? No? Okay, we thank him in any case. And then Jason Lewis from Southern California Gas. Um, I also very uh, Importantly, we quickly want to thank the Chancellor and his staff and this Board of Governors for their major encouragement of this important award program and the strategy that supports it. In particular, I want to acknowledge the Vice Chancellor Fred Harris, who's been able to partner uh, our facilities and buildings are. He's been really from start to finish an anchor in this process. So uh, with gratitude for your patience and that long wrap up, let me now get to the meat of the matter and talk about our awards. It's important to note and very encouraging that this year we received a total of 50 nominations in the three categories, and that's up from 46 entries that we received last year for our first cycle. Um, of those nominations, of those 50 nominations, today's winners are the following. First, Victor Valley Community College District won the District Leadership Award. District leaders made both a financial and a resource commitment to create a comprehensive sustainability program. The purpose of the program was to reduce the district's dependency on utilities, which in turn would lower future expenses. Sustainability projects included the installation of a one megawatt solar array on the main campus, the development of a 250 kilowatt solar parking lot system at the district's new public safety training center, and two <coughs> new kilowatt parking lot systems at its main campus. The district also completed a campus sustainable landscaping project where they removed 21,000 square feet of turf and replaced it with a drought tolerant landscaping that saves approximately 875,000 gallons of water every year. Pretty major accomplishment. 
A series of energy efficiency upgrades were also made to the main campus, and the district worked with Southern California Edison to install plug and uh, plug load controls, excuse me, and power management software on over 2,000 computers throughout the campus. For these very important accomplishments, please join me in congratulating and welcoming the superintendent and president of Victor Valley College, Christopher O'Hearn. Thank you very much. I appreciate this award and I'm accepting on behalf of uh, the Board of Trustees, the faculty, staff and students of Victor Valley College. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to thank the Board of Governors, to thank uh, Chancellor Harris, Vice Chancellor uh, uh, Fred uh, Harris, I'm, I'm so pleased uh, that you've worked so well with this college. None of this would not have happened without you without Southern California Edison, without all the vendors. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Fred, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Before yes. we go on, would you say a word about the actual award itself? Because I understand it has some uh, environmental sustainability properties. Yes, the award is, uh, I'm told by staff that it is a, the very fashionable green color this year, which is very popular in fashion. Um, <laughs> th that's number one. And number two, that it's, it's made out of 100% post-consumer um, um, recycled glass. and. Um, so it is pretty impressive and it will, um, you know, basically shine the light uh, for a long period of time on the achievements of each district. Well stated, thank you. Okay, we move on now to our faculty student initiatives category. In which category the winner this year is West Valley College. The college created the West Valley College Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Internship. This creative program uses the campus as a living laboratory and fulfills a hands-on requirement for the West Valley College Sustainability Certificate Program. The interns are involved in all aspects of sustainability on the campus with the focus on sustainable development, social justice, and issues pertaining to a holistic approach on environmental stewardship. Uh, this initiative has resulted in a growing group of highly mot motivated and visible sustainability advocates on the campus. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating the president of West Valley College, Bradley J. Davis, the lead internship director and associate faculty member, Anna Harrison, facilities manager, Bill Taylor, and a very special welcome to the students joining us from the lead internship program who I believe are in the room. <laughs> This award divides up in pieces, by the way. So. <laughs> okay, who among you will be the uh, spokesperson? Anna. Just introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Anna Harrison, and um, I, along with some other nutty people, John Diffenderfer, Bill Taylor, Lori Gaskin, Lori, come up here. <laughs> Uh, started this, uh, this is an unruly mob that's turned into a green movement on our campus and um, we're, uh, we're a very close-knit group as you can see so this is about half of the interns that have been through the program and huh. there's, there are more of us and we're very excited to spread 
the green Kool-Aid amongst all of the community colleges. Thank you for this honor. We've been working towards this for a long time, and, and uh, we're, we're delighted. Tell them how you got here today. Oh, we all carpool. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We absolutely all carpooled, and we all have our green nail polish. <laughs> How close is this group? <laughs> big car. So could I mention to the award winners, as you covet your award, we would ask you just to recycle it one more time and give it back to us because we'll represent it to you in June at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. Okay. <laughs> Inspiring. Okay, and uh, finally, for our third and final award today, uh, for facilities and operations, uh, we honor Santa Monica College. Uh, the Santa Monica College Board of Trustees developed and approved the Santa Monica College Energy Project. The initiative included three main components. First, replacing nine old and inefficient boilers on the campus. The second, exchanging 11,000 of the approximately 16,000 light fixtures on campus. And third, a comprehensive renovation for the Santa Monica College Center for Environmental and Urban Studies. Unfortunately, today is the board meeting day for Santa Monica Community College. So representatives are unable, sadly, to be here with us to accept the award. I would, however, like to acknowledge uh, my friend, the superintendent and president, uh, Chewy Sen, um, and also Genevieve Bertone, who is the director of sustainability, for their hard work in putting in uh, the effort, the time, and the talent needed to develop and implement uh, this award-winning project. Um, Santa Monica is my hometown. I'm going to be there fairly soon, so I will go to the good news directly to the superintendent and chancellor. Uh, this is going to conclude the 2013 Board of Governors Energy and Sustainability Award Ceremony. I would like to personally thank all of you for your important and hard work in this very important area and for helping position the California Community College system as a leader in energy conservation and sustainability efforts. Um, we all deeply appreciate everything that you're doing to help our community colleges conserve precious natural and fiscal resources in these very challenging times. I'm hoping that our colleges and districts will further build on your energy and your uh, innovation, your successes, and I'll look forward to congratulating the new group with very motivated, energetic, and forward thinkers next year. Thank you. You know, I would like, uh, while we have the maximum amount of our audience members here, I would like to acknowledge one more award today uh, before we uh, get into the rest of our business. And that is yesterday in a, in a White House ceremony, our uh, Vice Chancellor for Workforce Development, Von Tan Quinlivan, was uh, recognized as one of the distinguished and outstanding Asian uh, Pacific Island women in this country for her leadership in workforce development here in California and with the California Community Colleges. Uh, we've known she's a star for a long, long time, but it is nice to know that the Obama administration stepped up to the plate and recognized what we all knew. Would you give uh, a round of applause to Vice Chancellor? Uh,
Certainly, congratulations, uh, Vice Chancellor. It's a great honor, not only for you, but for all of us in having you uh, honored in this way. And uh, thank you, Member Ramos and <coughs> Vice Chancellor Harris for your uh, presentation of the awards, sustainability awards. Uh, I did speak over the weekend with uh, one of the members of the uh, Santa Monica College of Board, Louise uh, Jaffe, and she would, wanted to make sure that I expressed to the board uh, her great honor in receiving this on behalf of uh, the board and the administration there at Santa Monica. Okay. We'll move on to uh, item uh, 5.3, um, optimizing resources throughout statewide and regional partnerships. This item will include a presentation and discussion related to the variety of ways the Foundation for California Community Colleges works to provide direct support and savings to colleges throughout the California Community College system. Yes. Pleasure to introduce uh, the uh, uh, CEO of the Foundation, Keitha Mills. Keitha will uh, present this item to the board. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, President Baca, Vice President Baum, Chancellor, members of the board. Uh, pleased to be here this morning uh, to talk to you about the great work of the foundation. Um, the presentation that I'm going to go through today, I believe, was handed out this morning. It looks like this. Um, and this is a presentation that um, I've, we've put together that talks about um, the, the activities of the foundation that have direct benefit to the colleges. And this is a presentation that um, I've sort of been taking on the road as our roadshow, the foundation's roadshow. Um, I uh, had the opportunity to present at the, um, the League's Northern California CEO Conference. Um, I was just at the uh, trustee conference over the weekend and gave the presentation. Um, and it's really meant to um, I, you know, I think I, I mentioned uh, a couple of meetings ago when uh, I introduced our elevator speech that I still, as I go around the, you know, the state and uh, attend these different conferences and meetings and introduce myself, I still get a lot of, wow, I, I did not know we had a statewide foundation or, you know, tell me more about what you do. So, so what we're trying to do here is, is raise awareness about the work at the foundation and raise awareness around the importance of um, leveraging our resources um, as a, a statewide system. Uh, and it's, it's been pretty well received. Um, we've, uh, a lot of the college presidents and, and trustees, I think, are starting to think differently as new money is coming into the system and thinking about how do we use this money in, in the most um, efficient manner. So um, just quickly, I, I always start with our elevator pitch and, and talk about the fact that we were formed by the family for the family, that we are the official nonprofit for the Board of Governors and, and the Chancellor's Office, and the work that we do um, works to promote the initiatives of the Board of Governors, of the Chancellor's Office, and really works to benefit all 112 community colleges throughout the state. So, so our work really, our mission is to further the mission of the system and, and the colleges throughout the state. And when I talk about uh, the different activities that the foundation is involved in that has direct benefit for our colleges, we kind of uh, divide it up into, into three major categories. Um, the first of which is uh, learning programs, workforce development, and scholarships. Um, we also have our cooperative aggregate purchasing program, uh, otherwise known as our college buys purchasing program. Um, and then we also work to develop a number of statewide corporate and, and funder relationships um, that are meant to attract um, funders and, and corporations that want to support not only work that happens at the local level, but they also want to make a broader impact throughout California. So in the category of, of learning programs, there are an, another number of programs that the, that the foundation operates. Um, and, and while we, uh, we don't enjoy any direct support, governmental support from, from any governmental agencies, we do successfully compete for government contracts. So you'll see there's a number of programs, uh, foster youth services, student mental health programs, uh, our digital literacy program, uh, where we do attract governmental funds um, into the uh, foundation and we run programs and services utilizing those funds and push those dollars 
out to the colleges. So there's a number of programs that are like this. This is a small sample of the types of things that we do um, in this category. These programs, not all of the programs reach all 112 colleges, but when you take these types of programs in the aggregate, uh, the, the programs in totality do reach all 112 community colleges. Uh, we've successfully subgranted almost $20 million um, out to the colleges through these types of programs and served about 32,000 students throughout the state. In the category of workforce development, our major program here is our Career Pathways program, and you've heard me talk about this program from time to time, and we, we've taken a bit of a hit um, in, in this program this year. Uh, this program is a student internship program or a, um, a <coughs> workplace learning program for our students throughout the state. We've traditionally worked with state agencies um, and employed um, over 2,500 students through the life of this program, uh, at, primarily at a variety of state agencies. Um, we're now in a situation where we've really built this ro robust infrastructure um, to, to run this type of student internship program. And, and it's a, the, our, the internship program that we run is a little bit different in that we take on all of the back office work um, for the internship program uh, for the agencies and or the businesses that employ these students. So these students actually become an employee of record of the foundation, um, but they actually work out at the state agencies or the businesses and obtain their work-based experience. Um, at the businesses and, and those internships are actually funded um, by the business community. So it's a tremendous benefit uh, historically for the state agencies where as you can imagine trying to onboard an employee and especially a student who's on, only going to be there for a short period of time, um, it really takes a huge headache off of the, the state agency uh, to be able to utilize these, uh, these student internships or these student interns um, at, at very cost, at providing a very cost effective uh, workforce. We're now focused on trying to broaden that beyond the state agencies and look at um, getting deeper penetration into the business community. And what we're focused on here is, is really trying to target um, smaller to mid-sized companies who might need uh, a student workforce and be interested in employees, employing student interns, but may, may not have the robust infrastructure to be able to, to handle all the back office opportunities. So we're now starting to reach out to our career centers um, throughout the state at our colleges, uh, trying to develop robust partnerships there. We're working uh, with our workforce development teams throughout the state, our sector navigators uh, and, and those folks who are developing relationships with the business communities, looking at other funding streams where uh, there may be programs out there that have a uh, internship component as part of a broader um, learning, uh, student learning program and trying to, to find ways where we can use the infrastructure and the expertise that we've built at the, at the statewide level um, to again help the colleges and help our students um, uh, obtain these types of important work-based learning experiences. And this is a quote from one of our interns that I love. This is uh, Chris Rumble from American River College, who's an art and new media and graphics design major. And Chris says about his internship, every day here is like a class loaded with real world experience, driving home all of the lessons of my educational pursuit while adding a practical spin to production and the entire process. In the area of scholarships, I think this is where most people probably know us best from uh, the Osher Initiative, uh, where we've cre created uh, jointly uh, th uh, throughout the system a $70 million scholarship endowment that does uh, reach all 112 community colleges and provides about $3.5 million in scholarship funds uh, to our community college students uh, throughout the state. Um, this, uh, the, the endowments that we manage at the statewide level include not only the $70 million scholarship endowment, but we also manage a $10 million um, endowment that works to support nursing um, initiatives. And, and really what's exciting about, um, about this particular program is the infrastructure that, again, that has been built at the statewide level as it relates to investment management and the partnership that has been created between the Foundation for California Community College colleges, J.P. Morgan, and all 112 community colleges throughout the state. So what the Osher Initiative uh, uh, did was that it created a, a statewide endowment of $70 million, but that endowment was created through a team effort including all
all 112 colleges who had fundraising goals and, and matching incentives to go along with that. So for every dollar uh, that the foundations or the colleges raised, they were matched 50 cents on the dollar. And those, uh, every dollar that the colleges raised remained the assets of the colleges. Uh, but they were required to be invested in a statewide pool. So it really, it created this infrastructure at the statewide level where the, the college could continue to count their asset, count their revenue, uh, manage their donor relationship, uh, but then offload all of the back office investment management distribution, um, you know, the investment policy work, that sort of thing. And that all happens at the statewide level. And I think this is, this is really important infrastructure that never existed before. And it's really allowing our system to, to act like a wealthy system. So we're no longer, you know, a, a system of 112 community colleges with $500,000 here and $1,000 there and a million dollars here. We now are a system, a wealthy system, that has a statewide endowment totaling $80 million. And I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, to really grow in this area. And as uh, the, you know, the foundations kind of look at their individual endowments and, and the time and effort and resources they're putting into engaging their own investment management firm, um, engaging their own investment advisory committees, um, there may be other opportunity to continue to grow the statewide fund. Allow the fundraisers to do what they do best, be fundraisers, and take all the back office management um, off of the individual colleges. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here and I've been doing um, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, having a lot of conversations throughout the state about uh, where this might be possible uh, to, uh, to, to help some of our uh, colleges throughout the state. Our College Buys program, I think I talk about College Buys every time I get the chance to talk about College Buys. Uh, this is really, um, I think, a, a fantastic program for our system. And this is the program where we really work to build strategic partnerships um, with the, the business community and leverage the aggregate uh, purchasing power, buying power of our system. Again, when we act together as a whole, 112 colleges, 72 district, 2.4 million students and then all the administrators that go along with that. There is tremendous purchasing power when we band together for the things that we all invest in uh, commonly. Uh, so right now we're really just scratching the surface in, in this category um, and again a lot of opportunity here. Uh, we're, we're now in technology and software, um, office supplies and furniture, uh, fixture equipment and flooring. Uh, we're in the process of negotiating um, a, a contract for copier services, printing services. Um, and this is one that is, uh, again, it's a tremendous opportunity to the system, but it, it's still a, um, a, a challenge for us in that um, you know, we're, we cannot and, and would not want to mandate any of these contracts onto our colleges, but we want to make them available to all of our colleges. And it takes a, a lot of work to get the, to get the word out. Um, and a lot of times it takes a lot of work um, to, for, uh, to, to um, sell the value of the contracts uh, uh, because of the, the local control that, that's so important. So what we try to do, again, is not compete uh, with the local activities of the college, but try to supplement and provide um, other avenues uh, for colleges to, um, to save money. Um, and this is a quote from uh, Jose Ortiz, who uh, is the current chancellor for Peralta Community College District, and he's a huge fan of our, uh, thank you, Jarena, a uh, huge fan of our College Vice program as it relates to, um, to furniture, our furniture contracts. And really what we try to do with our furniture contracts is get the best total value. So we're not all about just try to find the cheapest price. It's about try to understand what the needs are of the system get products that match the needs of the system, make sure they have warranties, make sure they're the proper quality, and look at sustainability. So it's really a total package, and it's really based on this performance-based approach. So it's good value that includes price um, along with a, a number of other attributes. And Dr. Ortiz says um, that the, our college buys contracts have made it simple to select the right products for all of our performance needs. They help us to assure the taxpayers, as well as district-wide staff, that the funds are being spent intelligently. So, you know, not only do we work to save um, 
tons of money for our colleges, faculty, staff, and students through this program, but we really also work to, to really create a partnership with our business community. And I, I talked a lot, I think, at the last meeting about um, a number of our corporate partnerships and how we really try to kind of braid the relationship, um, not only from a consumer perspective, but also from a philanthropic perspective, um, and, and trying to find ways uh, to partner with entities that um, that understand the need to support at the local level, but also want to make a bigger impact uh, by supporting at the, at the statewide level. Um, this program also works to support our staff on the ground at the campuses. Uh, so we, um, we uh, sponsor a centralized online forum uh, for purchasing directors uh, to, to come together and kind of share issues that they're having, uh, you know, talk about new ideas, that sort of thing. We also uh, sponsor an annual um, purchasing conference that happens in San Diego every year. We offer that uh, pro bono free to all of the attendees and for many of these folks this is the only opportunity for them to come together and get this type of professional development. It's always very well attended um, and it's, uh, it's, it's really nice way for us to give back to the system in this way. This is uh, just a sample of a variety of partners that we work with, and I think I went through a number of these uh, at, at our last meeting, so I won't spend a bunch of time on this. But there are a number of partnerships that have been created, and we're always looking um, for that, uh, that, that next partnership that makes sense for the system. Um, this is uh, just a, a screenshot of the College Buys uh, website where uh, folks can go on and take advantage of our software deal. As you guys all recall, uh, we've negotiated um, a screaming deal with Microsoft. Uh, you can get Microsoft Office for $39.99, um, a license. It's uh, cheaper than it's offered anywhere. Um, and we're really trying to get the word out on this because this is uh, it, it's an amazing deal. And it's only available to California community colleges, faculty, staff, and students. Uh, that includes all of you. Uh, if uh, you're in need of software and uh, go to the website, your section would be for the uh, faculty staff. Uh, you would click on that section and go through the process that way. Um, we're also talking to colleges about um, trying to get uh, real estate on um, campus websites as well to promote these types of um, uh, offerings and really try to get the word out to the students. So. Um, uh, we we uh, are making, I guess, slight inroads in this area. As you can imagine, it's very difficult to, you know, every uh, website is managed separately, so trying to get out there and get the folks to add links and that sort of thing, but making small progress there. Um, finally, on the um, area of statewide uh, corporate and funder relationships, um, again, we work really hard to work with funders and corporations who um, who want to make a bigger splash at the at the uh, statewide level. And this one is a little bit tricky because we have to be really careful not to compete with what's happening at, at the uh, local level. So we work really closely uh, with the Network for California Community College Foundations who, that uh, includes representatives from um, a number of the foundations throughout the state so that we stay in tune with what's happening at the local level, um, additional needs that we may be able to fill at the statewide level, and make sure that we're working collaboratively to really leverage um, funder relationships throughout the state. So uh, over the years, we've brought in about $5.2 million in, um, in corporate partnership funding um, and in over $15 million in philanthropic grants, um, actually just in uh, this past year alone. Chancellor Circle is uh, um, another opportunity for us to partner not only with uh, the colleges throughout the state but with our corporate partners. Um, a number of the corporate partners you see here also support at the, um, at the local level. Um, I know a number of you have attended these Chancellor Circle events. We have about eight to ten throughout the year. Thank you to Chancellor Harris for, uh, for supporting these events. It's, uh, I think, a, an important opportunity to get out to the colleges, to be able to showcase uh, various colleges throughout the state, and, and to be able to showcase uh, the partners who really make an investment um, at, at the statewide level. Um, Pepsi is an important sponsor, and um, I don't know if you guys noticed there's a, a, a little sign recognizing um, Pepsi for their donation today. So they have uh, donated the, uh, uh, the product uh, for today's Board of Governors meeting, and, and they make a, a number of donations throughout the year for these types of meetings. They're an important partner in that um, they, uh, they, they work with us to, um, to offer 
um, individual grants to uh, the, the districts or the colleges who, um, who enter into a contract with Pepsi. They're also really good about not only making investments at the statewide level, uh, but also making those investments and in sponsoring events at the at the local level. Uh, Pepsi has provided over 1.4 million dollars over the term of our contract with them in uh, both financial and program support. Uh, that go that goes directly to the partnering colleges. Um, Finally, the last thing that I want to talk about is our fiscal sponsorship services, and, and this is um, an area where, um, again, at the statewide level, I talked about um, a number of programs that we actually run from the statewide level and push funds out to the colleges. So, our, you know, our budget is about anywhere between 30 to, you know, $45 million, depending how on how the contracts kind of ebb and flow from year to year. So, as you can imagine, we've had to um, really build out a pretty robust back office system from uh, accounting to IT to HR um, to grant management, grant reporting, that sort of thing. And so this is a service that we've um, uh, been able to <coughs> offer and outsource uh, to a number of different projects um, or, or campuses um, that may be running programs that aren't maybe the best fit um, within their kind of campus infrastructure, perhaps they're trying to raise uh, philanthropic dollars or trying to, um, you know, do something a little bit more nimble. Uh, that's where we can come in and provide uh, fiscal sponsorship services. Again, let the program people do what they do best, run the programs, take all of that back office headache off and, and centralize that at the statewide level. Uh, so we're currently supporting uh, the network of California Community College Foundations as their fiscal sponsor, the Career Ladders Program, uh, the San Francisco Welcome Back Center, um, and the uh, Emoja Project in this way. And again, this is just um, a sample of, there's probably a list of 10 others that, uh, uh, that we provide services like this for. And I want to end with a, a, a final quote that um, I, I think is really important, and this is a quote from uh, Doug Houston, who's the chancellor for the Yuba Community College District, and this is a quote that comes from uh, Comstock's uh, magazine uh, back in February 20, 2012, and Chancellor Houston says that um, rural community colleges in California are in peril right now, especially small single college districts. For small college districts, there's all this administrative structure necessary to run a college, but no way to spread the costs or enjoy economies of scale. And, you know, as I've been throughout the state and, and sharing this presentation, um, you know, I always say I, I, I talk a lot about what the foundation does because that, you know, that's what I know and I can give you, you know, real examples of, of how this works at the statewide level from the foundation perspective. But, you know, whether, whether the colleges are partnering with the foundation or they're partnering together, you know, the, the message is that, um, that we can be so much more efficient and cost effective um, in a number of areas if we band together and, and work together to drive the price down um, and or provide other economies of scale. Um, and so, you know, we're looking forward, we're, we're developing more and more partners uh, throughout the state with our colleges and, um, and, and looking forward to um, more to come from that. As you guys are out and about at your, in your local communities or at your colleges, if you see opportunities where um, a discussion um, might be, uh, you know, helpful, I'm happy to, um, to go and present or uh, to, uh, to meet with anyone on the campuses to see if there are opportunities to partner. Uh, with that, I would uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, President Mills, for that uh, very uh, good overview. It's always interesting to get an update on what the foundation is, is doing, and I know that uh, all the members uh, certainly appreciate the work that the foundation does on behalf of uh, the chancellor's office and the system itself. Are there any uh, questions? Uh, Vice President Ball. Sure. First off, as I've said before, I'm a fan of the College Buys program, and in fact, I made a purchase about two weeks ago of Thank the you. Adobe suite of software and saved probably about $1,500 as a result okay. of using that. So, um, I may, uh, last Wednesday at my board meeting, we were making some expenditures, and one of them just kind of popped my eyes out was uh, we're, we're outfitting our new music building, and we were buying pianos, Steinway pianos, and for 11 pianos, it was $750,000. Now, it made me think that um, our musical instruments, the types of uh, uh, items that could actually be benefit from a, a group purchasing arrangement, because any district with a music program, I expect, will need all kinds of uh, musical instruments that hopefully uh, are high quality, but uh, with uh, the power of purchasing, maybe there's a, mm -hmm. a, a better price break that can happen. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. 
and then um, also on the area of, uh, of services, and I don't know if it's a, um, uh, you mentioned HR too, uh, one of the things districts are always struggling with is employee recruitment services mm -hmm. too, and I, I, I don't know if that's a possibility. I know the uh, ACCT offers some executive search uh, support too, mm -hmm. but uh, is that something that uh, might be available to districts as well? Oh, that's another great idea, thank you. Yeah. We've traditionally done the student inter um, internship recruiting, but you know the infrastructure is you know should be similar. Uh, recruiting is recruiting, no matter what your uh, uh, population is. So thank you. That's a great idea. Sure. Any other uh, members? Uh, this is just a general comment. Uh, uh, it's a, a very excellent report, uh, Keith. And uh, I just wanted to say that uh, you know being on the foundation board of directors now for the past several months you know it's been a you know terrific experience uh, I'm just very impressed by your leadership and the team that you've assembled and it's uh, you know really uh, to me I think the the best I've seen the foundation you know in the entire time I've been here on the board of governors so you know Thank my you. congratulations to you and to the foundation and to bringing this uh, real business sense to the foundation's mission Thank you you know, I would simply I would simply add that you know without the uh, support of the foundation, uh, most of the awards programs you see, the ones you saw earlier today, uh, the, the Rice uh, program, um, uh, many of the of the activities that go beyond what a traditional uh, state agency is able to do, wouldn't be possible without the support of the foundation. So. Um, all of this activity that uh, Keith mentions benefits not only the colleges and uh, the students, but it certainly benefits the chancellor's office. And, and uh, you know, I can't say enough in appreciation for the work that Keith and her team do uh, to, you know, to try to provide us a margin of excellence here that we couldn't get otherwise. Thank you. Here, here. Member Robinson. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I wonder, uh, Chancellor and uh, President Mills, if there has been an opportunity with the appointment of our, our new chancellor to position him in front of some of the leading funders that either we have worked effectively with and could do more with, or funders that we've really not had a relationship with, but we could and should. Yeah. Um, and um, I know you're a very busy guy. You've got a lot of uh, <laughs> fires <laughs> burning. But it seems to me that this is a unique moment, uh, this window, uh, the first year of Chancellor Harris's uh, tenure to develop those relationships. I, I believe that, uh, in my experience in philanthropy, relationships are so critical, as they are in pretty much every line of business. Mm -hmm. But uh, having relationships, confidence, a sense of the leader's vision, I think, is um, something that uh, sits very squarely in the, the mindset of funders, I think. And if there is opportunity to, uh, to have something like a, a structured you know, outreach campaign to some targeted mm -hmm. funders, I, I believe that would be a, a good use of our, our time. Uh, I defer to the chancellor in terms of, you know, his judgment on that matter. Well, she's running me all over the place. <laughs> okay. So what's happening? <laughs> <I'm telling> <laughs> he has been a <laughs> tremendous partner, <laughs> and wherever I ask him to go, he is right there. We we had a um, a, a really uh, productive uh, meeting with the original student success funder group. There was uh, I want to say three to five funders that were involved in the uh, student success initiative and uh, we pulled those folks together in uh, San Francisco in connection with the AACC conference that was happening. Uh, fed them a lunch, uh, introduced them to the chancellor and uh, talked to them about the progress we uh, have made on the student success initiative and they were all I think you know very important press, uh, very uh, pleased to have the opportunity uh, to meet the Chancellor, uh, but I think even more interested in hearing about the progress that's been made in, in such, uh, I think, a short period of time for, for our system. So that was, uh, I think, one, one meeting that we were able to pull, you know, kind of a, a group of them together and, uh, and use our time a little efficiently. But we've had a number of meetings like that with uh, several other funders. We're uh, scheduled to meet with uh, Mary Bitterman with the Osher Foundation later this month, which is an important uh, relationship. And so I just, um, I've been really um, excited about um, Bryce's leadership and his support of the work of the foundation and his understanding of the importance of the role of fundraising in community colleges, not only with the private funder uh, uh, community, but also with the, with the business community as well. So it's, it's been a terrific partnership. I would just add along those lines, first of all, I, I shouldn't be surprised to know that 
that partnership has already taken shape. But um, in terms of the conundrum of trying to strike the balance between you know seizing opportunities and not getting in the way of the local districts, um, it strikes me that, uh, and this is po possibly what you're doing now with this cohort of funders that we talked about, but uh, trying to target more significant regional corporations and foundations and more national, even global funders that have an interest in our issues is one certain way, in my judgment, to avoid that conflict because mm -hmm. it's very unlikely that those more significant funders are going to fund any individual component of our system. They're going to want an intermediary of the scale and scope of the foundation. That's right. And that is a great competitive advantage that I would uh, hope that we can take advantage of. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Reed. Um, I'd like to just touch, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'd like my board members to, to share uh, <coughs> what you can that when we first hired J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, to say the least, we, we got behind the eight ball on the performance of that um, monies for the Osher Foundation. And it's been an ongoing battle for Keitha and, and the investment committee. And I think she has some pretty good information. We're going to meet again today at 2. But could you share uh, how that's changed within the last few months and, and what we're looking forward to? <coughs> Sure. So when the um, when the funds uh, initially came in to the foundation, uh, they actually came in the form of a check. So we got cash uh, in, in the door, uh, and the initial cash was that was twenty five million dollars. And then we immediately embarked on a fundraising campaign, and then funds started coming in, you know, daily, monthly. Um, annually for for about three years so we had to go through um, a, a pretty thoughtful phase in process of investing that you know we had to come up with our investment policy we had never done this before so we had to start from scratch investment policy figure out what the appropriate uh, investment vehicles were and then phase this cash in over time so when the money first came in I believe that was May of 2006 you guys recall the market was here and then the market did this mm -hmm. <laughs> and thankfully we were still sitting in cash so we were heroes so we were heroes for about the first year and then we started uh, you know investing and putting money in and so as we started to phase the money in the market started to do this again and so we were being very thoughtful about um, about how the money was being phased in we used an 18 month uh, period to phase the money in so we missed a little bit of the you know the, the market run up so we were heroes at the beginning and then you know kind of uh, as we started to invest it was like oh darn I wish we would have invested a little a little faster and then you know if any of you guys are invested in the market you know that it, while it was you know kind of over a long period of time it's been doing this it's still been doing a little bit of this up and down and uh, we've taken a few hits here and there so over over the three to five years that we've been managing the endowment it's been um, well let me back up and say it was very important to, to the Osher Foundation that we maintain the um, the distributions and so uh, despite the fact that earnings weren't sufficient to meet the distributions uh, the Osher Foundation said we want the money out in the colleges so we approve your 5% distributions so what that meant was that the fund um, started out basically underwater that we were spending principal in the first years of the fund um, so f until about gosh maybe six or nine months ago um, we were in an underwater position where our spending had exceeded um, our, our earnings with the permission of, of the Osher Foundation. Um, this last uh, quarterly uh, report that we received from JP Morgan shows that we're now, we've not only recovered that excess spending, but we're now in a position of having about $4 million excess um, in, in reserves over um, what the original principle is. So it's been, um, it's been a long and uh, sometimes scary road <laughs> with investment management, but I think we've made um, a really sound choice in our investment advisors that were invested for the long long haul um, and that they've been really good to work with us to say you know what the market's gonna the market's gonna blip up and down and you can't get too excited about it and you need to invest for uh, for the long term and, and stick it out and that's really paid off and I think we're um, really excited about where we sit today and you know that the, the better the fund performs um, the more opportunity there is to provide even additional scholarships um, for our California Community College students so I think a lot of opportunity there, and it's been a really tremendous partnership. And, and Gary, thank you, or Member Reed, thank you for your uh, participation on the Investment Advisory Committee. That's uh, uh, it's been really important to have your expertise and and uh, your comments as part of that meeting. Any other comments? <clears throat>
Thank you, Keith. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. You bet. Look forward to continue to work with you. Before we move on to the next item, I would like just like to to thank Member Hawkins for uh, helping us through this morning and, and, and honoring our classified employees. Uh, the state, excellent group of folks. Uh, you know, I know that uh, a lot of folks sitting out there were there supporting them, uh, but uh, good people, and thank you very much for doing that for us. Uh, item uh, 5.4, update on student success initiative implementation. Decided presents information on the implementation of the Student Success Task Force recommendations. Chancellor. Thank you, uh, President Baca, members of the board. Uh, we have a couple of folks who are going to uh, come to the uh, podium to uh, give you a quick update on our student success activity. And I think what you're going to see in the next uh, few minutes will uh, be a, a, a great uh, uh, excitement to all of you. Uh, Eric's going to give you an overall uh, update, and then uh, Patrick's going to show you a couple things that I think uh, in uh, in typical high fashion chancellor's uh, rhetoric are going to blow your socks off. So uh, <laughs> with that, uh, Eric, I'll turn it over to you. Good morning, uh, President Abaca, members of the Board of Governors, Chancellor Harris. Um, <clears throat> we are going to, um, the primary focus of this presentation is going to be the scorecard, and uh, Vice Chancellor Perry is going to walk you through um, th that accountability tool as well as, as another tool that, that he's been working on, our team's been working on, that's focused on, um, on uh, um, monitoring and, and uh, measuring improvements in, st in, in earnings of our students once they complete our programs. But I did want to start with a broad overview, and, and we provide you uh, today with the, uh, the implementation matrix, this document, um, it's at, at your desk that, uh, as you recall, um, identifies the 22 separate recommendations of the task force and uh, marks where we are in terms of progress on each one. At this point, 21 of the 22 recommendations are in, in progress, and uh, many of them are far uh, down the path, and some are just, just getting started. And, uh, you know, the, I, I would just underscore that the, uh, your team here in the Chancellor's Office is, is hard at work. It continues to be our, um, our, our playbook that we're working from as we try to um, move our system forward and uh, uh, the we're working closely in partnership with literally hundreds of stakeholders from across the system who are involved in various work groups uh, these are faculty students staff that are that are on the different implementation work groups so it's it's uh, uh, an exciting time to be working on these issues and I think we're making great progress and you, and your leadership is key in that um, so in terms of, you know, taking stock of where we're at, you know, this has been a big year for, for uh, the system and for, 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 the, uh, for uh, your success agenda that you've pushed forward. Um, the major cornerstones have been laid. The uh, SB 1456, Senator Lowenthal's bill put in place. The, uh, both the, the kind of recasting and refocusing of SB 1456, uh, rather of, this, of uh, our student support programs. So this is re reorienting and focusing the, the matriculation program. And um, obviously yesterday you uh, did some heavy lifting uh, during the first reading on the regulations that will we'll put, the, put that uh, legislation into, into practice and actually in, in, and uh, we'll, uh, actually we'll, we'll build that into the system's regulations and it will become a, the part of the, our daily, daily practice and daily work as a system. Um, you, you also uh, oversaw the implementation of uh, enrollment priorities, system-wide enrollment priorities. That was a, a major step forward, another cornerstone. Um, and uh, th so the scorecard, shifting to the, the scorecard is, is another really fundamental recommendation of the task force that, that speaks to uh, putting in place a, uh, a, a stronger accountability system uh, for, for the community colleges. The, for the community colleges that's, that's better focused on measuring student progress and student success. And uh, this accountability, accountability tool, which uh, Vice Chancellor Perry will walk you through, is, is really, you know, I think was envisioned as a task force, by the task force, as a tool that, that state leaders could use, the governor, the legislature, other state leaders, you as a board of governors could use to, to uh, monitor uh, the progress of, of the community college system as we move forward to improve completion rates. Uh, but perhaps even more importantly, it was intended as a tool to guide local decision making at the Board of Trustees level 
um, at each each of our colleges will have a, the scorecard that will break out student success metrics both in terms of high order completion metrics transfer um, completion of degrees and certificates but also this tipping point metrics that, that show that the students are moving down the path towards success um, and, and, and it, re it really is was the task force's hope and it's, it's our hope that this accountability accountability tool will kind of uh, in inject some some new uh, data and a, and a new focus on student success at that local level so that as local boards are making programmatic choices making budgetary choices that they they're focused on what which investments which program changes will be most effective at moving the needle and, and improving these success rates. And so with that, Vice Chancellor Perry is going to walk you through some of the nuts and bolts of how the systems, uh, um, how it operates, and then ho hopefully we, uh, we can have a robust conversation about uh, uh, next steps here. Hey, thank you, Eric. Uh, good morning, President Baca and members of the board. I'm going to give you an update on the progress and implementation of our student success scorecard and also a live demonstration of both the scorecard and of a program, an application that is currently in beta. It's not open to the public yet, but will likely be out near the end of May that we're calling Wage Tracker that shows the wage outcomes of our graduates. So the Student Success Task Force uh, gave us advice on the creation of a Student Success Scorecard. It's recommendation 7-3. They advised us to continue to measure the high order outcomes in the system, uh, students who get a degree, who get a certificate, and who transfer to a four-year institution. They advised us to measure momentum points along the path to those successes. And they also said, let's focus on the past performance of a campus and not so much peer performance. Uh, if you recall our old accountability system, ARC, Accountability Report for Community College, there was a lot of peer grouping went on. Um, this one was focused on your own campus's past performance. Advised us that we should expand the populations measured in our accountability system. Our old ARC report had a reasonably high standard for some of the metrics to get in, uh, namely 12 units. We've, we've lowered that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. We should build upon the existing art framework and the processes that came from that, uh, mostly at a local campus, um, that this report needs to go to a local board of trustees annually. We should use our existing MIS data collection. This is a very good data collection. We should not collect any new data for this, so there is no new data burden that went on. And we should definitely move to improve the transparency to multiple audiences who view the scorecard. The old accountability report was one 850-page PDF report, not particularly easily um, digested, shall we say. Uh, we've built a, a multi-layered web-based reporting tool that encompasses the scorecard. Implementation of this was actually pretty rapid. Uh, over the course of the, of the first half of uh, 2012, we had a task force that met five times in those six months. They went through all the existing data definitions, created new and expanded data definitions, um, refined the focus on final outcomes and significant momentum points, simplified the levels of reportings for various different audiences. And uh, I should also mention, we actually reduced the number of metrics that are in this report, make it, made it uh, much clearer. The display of the scorecard actually has four layers to it. The scorecard is just one of the levels. There's a statewide aggregation, also known as a state of the system report. My guess is that will come out later on this summer, but that'll be at a very high level statewide aggregation of all the metrics. The scorecard layer itself aggregates things by college, by whether a student started at a remedial or a collegiate level upon entry, and by major primary demographic, which was something that was not in the old ARC report. A layer below, we have what's called the data mart level, which gives you the, the ability to do cross tabulation, so you can do by age, by gender, for instance. And then finally, a data on demand layer, which allows the campuses to download their actual unit records that went into the creation of all of these metrics that is password protected. So I'm going to do something eminently dangerous and try and do a live demonstration here, which hopefully I've queued up and still works. Scorecard is located at scorecard.cccco.edu. When you go there, you will have a splash page. On that front page, you have a documentation link that gives you all of the details of all the metrics and how they are 
generated and, and defined. Your pull down menu gives you the opportunity to select your campus or you can do a statewide look. I'll actually do the statewide, um, actually hold on, let me pick a campus and I'll go back. Okay. Here's the statewide view. You immediately are put into a profile page which tells you uh, various certain demographic information about either your campus or the state, how many students, what's the distribution by gender, age, and ethnicity, and some other information that we put in there, how many FTE, how many course sections you put on, your median credit section size, and your percentage of full-time faculty. The metrics are actually tabs on the top here. So the first metric is called persistence. I think I can make this a little bigger. So this is a momentum point metric. It measures for degree in transfer seeking student populations, whether upon entry they are enrolled contiguously for three primary terms. So a student starts in fall, they must be enrolled fall, spring, fall. If they start in spring, they're enrolled spring, fall, spring. You'll notice that it's broken down by whether the student entered prepared, meaning they never ever had to take a remedial course in our system at any time, or unprepared, meaning they had to have attempted at least one remedial course at some point in their academic history, and then an overall aggregation. You can see the breakdowns by gender, age, and ethnicity, some definitions on the bottom. That is persistence. The 30 unit rate is for the same degree in transfer population, this is the percentage of students who achieve basically the halfway point to an associate's degree or a, f or a full CSU or UC transfer, 30 units. Um, you can see at this point the numbers for the college prepared students now are surpassing the unprepared group. Finally, the completion rate here, what we call the SPAR rate, student, student progress and attainment rate, um, is the actual hybrid um, what percentage of this population earned a degree, a certificate, a transfer to a four-year institution, or what we call transfer prepared, which is earned 60 units that are CSU transferable with a GPA of 2.0. So the actual system-wide com combined hybrid grad and transfer rate is 49.2%. Um, at this point, you'll also notice the prepared and the unprepared groups start to have major differences, so <clears throat> this visualization of those two subgroups becomes pretty enlightening as far as the students who show here at a prepared level actually do pretty well. Um, anybody going through a remedial path certainly has a, a lower um, completion rate. Patrick, before you move off that matrix, I, I want to again remind the board that this is perhaps the most telling chart statewide for the system. And as you can see, if students come to us as college students, they have a better than 70% chance of completing, of being successful. If they come to us unprepared, you see that drops down uh, to just above uh, 40%. The other statistic that's uh, important to view this is that only 33% of our students fall into that college ready category. 77% of the students are in that second quadrant unprepared for college. So this is the, the wonderful news and the tragic news about the challenges that we're facing. Our students do, frankly, as well and in some cases better than selective institutions if they're ready to go to college. But they struggle mightily if they're not. And we can't say often enough how important it is to uh, figure out a, a better way of delivering remedial education in our system and to challenge students to be prepared to go to college when they get here. And so of all the charts that you'll look at, when you look at a college or at the statewide, this is a snapshot of what's wonderful about our colleges and the challenges that we face at the same time. Thank you. Uh, also, I wanted to add the visualization of primary demographic here allows this report to be used as an equity report. It shows you the gaps in performance between these subpopulations as well. Um, the next metric here is also a momentum point. This is the remedial completion metric. Uh, anyone who ever attempts any remedial course in our system is going to be counted in this if they start in a remedial path. The outcome here is they must complete the entire sequence 
in either math, English, or ESL, um, up to the degree applicable or, or transferable level. So no longer are we counting small steps up. It's, this is the completion of the entire sequence. Um, and uh, as Chancellor Harris said, this is definitely one of the areas that we struggle with and need to work on. The CTE metric is uh, roughly a proxy for program completion rate for students in CTE pathways. Um, you notice it is just aggregated at an overall level and not broken down by collegiate or remedial. This is primarily because we have a, a lot of the remediation going on in CTE programs encompassed within the CTE program itself. So it was difficult to break this out for a lot of campuses, so we just kept it at a high level aggregate level. Down here on the bottom, we have printable reports that you can download. It'll give you all the numbers for your campus for the current year. Uh, and another view here that will give you a five-year historical on all of these numbers broken down by all of the demographics. Looks like this. Gives you the size of the cohorts and then five years worth of running data. So when I discussed you need to measure your performance against past performance, this is where you get that. All the metrics are on the bottom. So that is the scorecard. Any questions before I move on to the next item? So my, my question is just now that uh, you've, you've done an amazing job of, of pulling all this data together in an easily digestible form, how are we going to use it now too so that uh, we can then identify areas that need, we may need to focus special attention on as well? The, the board will recall at your retreat a few months ago, we began to introduce the conversation about goal setting. And now that we have this tool up and live, we'll be back to you probably in July with uh, a renewed conversation about statewide goal setting. And then hopefully later this year, the board will actually adopt a set of uh, statewide goals. It'll be more than just um, what's in this scorecard, but the scorecard's what we'll use to measure our progress. And then, uh, and that, by the way, is another of the, uh, of the uh, recommendations in the task force report. And then it, it's certainly our hope and our expectation that the colleges uh, in the system will then voluntarily set their own uh, college-based goals based on the, the statewide goals. And so, uh, this tool becomes a way to measure our uh, progress and we all know that when you agree you're going to measure something and set goals on something, you tend to, to see improvement. In there. That's where your resources go, that's where your attention goes. And, and so um, it, it, I think it's a much more compelling conversation about setting goals when you know you're going to be able to track whether, you're, whether it's, it's working. And if I could add, I, I, I think it's worth noting that the, this scorecard has been very well received um, nationally and in California. We've uh, attracted a, a, a great deal of positive attention uh, in uh, publications from the Chronicle of Higher Education to um, you know, new, newspapers up and down the state. And I, I think some of those we've, we've forwarded uh, those clippings to you. And I, I, would, um, I, I would also note that within the Capitol, uh, we've been uh, received a great great amount of praise not only from legislators uh, from the governor's office uh, but also our colleagues at the Department of Finance and at the legislative analyst office so key decision makers in, in the capital are paying attention to this so it, you know if we want to think about kind of how, how does the scorecard fit into um, you know wh what do we do with this I, I think part of the conversation is that we need to keep talking with state leaders about this to make sure that they are um, um, on board with our the, the success agenda and that they're putting resources behind it and so that in we we think we're, we're well positioned to, to have an initial investment in the student success and support program that you worked on yesterday in those regulations and and if if we are successful at getting an, an initial down payment in that program I think that uh, I think it'll be evidence that the that the the scorecard has has uh, helped boost our credibility in the state capital um, and then perhaps the most exciting thing is that once, once our colleges have some new money to work for, with, they can, they can put together, they can use that student success and support program funding to build local programs to move the needle. And that's really at the level where I think we're going to see the, the biggest progress um, and not, not to devalue your role as a board, but at that local level where they're building programs, deciding where, where to, you know, how to offer an orientation, 
how to provide counseling services, how to do education planning, that's what's really going to make the difference for our students. Yeah, and I, I appreciate, I don't know who, who distributed it, but you gave this uh, column by my colleagues at USC from Estella uh, uh, Ben Simone and Alicia Dowd that said that's exactly what needs to be done uh, in order to put more uh, teeth in, in, uh, into the scorecard so that. Uh, so I, I think it was a good analysis that uh, they provided in, in a way that uh, how we can just not rest on the fact that it's on the web, but now it's a tool to act for action. Sure. You know, I, I was going to add this, but probably it's appropriate to just interject it right now. Uh, of course, Bryce Harris and I were both on, on the task force, and early on I, th I think we, we were struggling to, to, to focus in and to, to really get off the ground. Uh, of course, all the vice chancellors and staff, the chancellors offered, we're, we're engaged in, in that, that discussion along with task force members. But I have to say, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Perry, I think, uh, it deserves a lot of credit for bringing some of that discussion together because it was kind of like the foundation. And this thing about transparency, I think, is, is extremely important in terms of addressing all of those task force recommendations. Without, without that, I think it, it, it doesn't have quite the anchor. So thank you for, for your involvement and your leadership in, in that whole process. Go Thank ahead. you. Appreciate it. So uh, the next item I'm going to demonstrate for you here, like I mentioned, is it, it is in beta, uh, and we are at the moment calling it Wage Tracker. It may have another name, but uh, internally we're calling it that. Here is how this works. Uh, some number of years ago, I think it was back in the late uh, 2000s, our system passed a bill that enabled our office to be a repository of Employment Development Department wage data. They collect quarterly wage records from employers in the state. And the key field on this uh, wage data is Social Security number, which is something we have available to match on. So every year now, we send all of the SSNs in our system over to EDD for matching, and what we get back are all of the wage records for all of the students in our system. Uh, originally, we used this for Perkins reporting, and if you recall in our ARC report, we had one table in there that showed the, the aggregate value of degrees in our system. But we have now uh, advanced this work uh, into what we call the wage tracker. Methodologically, what we're looking at is this. We're going to look at all the graduates in any particular year in our system, and we're going to first check and see are they still enrolled anywhere in our system, or did they transfer to another institution. So what we're looking for is students who we think should be out in the labor force. If they're still enrolled or if they transferred to a four-year institution, we're going to take them out of this analysis because they're probably not in the workforce or eligible in the workforce. We're measuring what we call true leavers, and we're measuring the value of the, the terminal community college degree or certificate. We're not measuring the value of what did they get after they transferred, so this is um, the value of got a degree with us and went immediately into the labor force. We need a minimum 10 wage matches for this to be valid. We don't want to do this on very tiny ends. Not all the programs in our state meet that threshold. Some of these programs produce just a few graduates every year. And one caveat, if the student is self-employed or employed by the federal government or the, or the military, they are not in the state's EDD wage file, so those are not in there. We adjust all of the wages to current year CPI, so you're looking at current dollars. And we've built two um, beta applications. The first one is called Wages by Program by Year. This aggregates the entire state, all the graduates from all the community colleges. And we're measuring that two years before they got their award, two years after they got their award, which to us represents they're out in the, in the job market. We've given them some time to find a degree. This is roughly their starting salary. And then five years after the award, or roughly journey level salary. So here is a demonstration of this. It will be on our data mart. In this case, we can go in and select all the award recipients in a particular year. In this case, I'll select 0506. You can go in and select what program type I can select health here. You can actually break it down to very specific programs. You can select what award they earned. In this case, I'm going to select all the, all the award types, associates and certificates. And what I get here in return tells me this.
for all the students who graduated in 0506 who are not still enrolled and who did not transfer for these particular programs that they got their degree in for instance dental hygienists they got an associate's degree in dental hygienists two years before they got that award the median wage for those for those students was twelve thousand nine eighty a year two years after they got that award their median wage was sixty four oh five eight and then five years after it was sixty eight or fifteen these are the actual wages of our community college graduates up and down the state in that program okay let's stop you Patrick I'm yeah. sorry to keep interrupting but now I want you to I want you to repeat those numbers and I want you to internalize what's being said here this is what these students were making two years before they got a degree with us or, or a certificate two years and five years after. I want you to think about it not only from the return on investment from the state of California and the taxpayer, but more importantly, what that means to a young person who finishes a degree and gets into the world of work. Just, just pick another one, Patrick, and read the numbers. All right. I will pick paramedic, okay. which actually is the highest paying award uh, wage-wise. You'll note the starting wage for paramedics, which is a chancellor's office certificate, approved certificate. Um, a lot of these folks were working uh, before, two years before. So their two-year prior wage was 40339 Their two years after wage is 102301 and their five years after wage is 113360 Yay! <laughs> okay. Now, Patrick, let's be honest. Let's pick my old theater career and show them how bad that really is. We can do that because this is all awards, not just CTE awards. This is every associate's degree and certificate. That would probably be in fine arts, right? Yep. So, here are the wage outcomes of students in fine arts, of which there are four programs that have a high enough end to be tracked, art, commercial music, graphic art and design, and music. The NA on there says um, we didn't find 10 wage records, so that just turns up as an NA. Uh, but in this case, um, art, a degree in art, two years before is 12254, two years after 26075, five years after 26571. Now okay. keep in mind they still more than doubled their Absolutely. compensation, but I, I don't want you to think everybody who gets a, a degree is going to quadruple, but uh, the, the, the important fact here is that regardless of whether um, a student is in the arts, for example, which is known as not being a high paying profession, when I used to teach in the theater area, I, I used to tell my students uh, to remember that 80% of the people who declare theater as their uh, 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 their career on their income tax forms make below the national poverty line. It, it is still an important industry in the state of California. The entertainment industry is a huge employer. The wages aren't enormous, but they it is significant the change that takes place with a community college uh, credential, uh, regardless of what the field is. And if, if I could add, I think something that's important to keep in mind as you look at this is that, um, remember, as Patrick laid out for you, we, uh, if a student transfers, they're not in this database. And so, for instance, uh, in some of these fields, uh, the, the fine arts, um, uh, philosophy, uh, history, um, if, if the individual ended up transferring, they, and earning their bachelor's degree and maybe even going on to get a, a, a graduate degree, um, their, their earnings could be considerably different than what's showing up in this graph. And that's part of what we're working on, is to get the, the data, the, the wage data, for those transfer students as well. Uh, so, th But this, this speaks only to the return on the investment uh, to the student uh, for that associate's degree or the certificate. It's important to keep that in mind. If they got their degree and then they transferred and got their bachelor's within four years, would they show up on the five-year? They would not. They would not. No. So this is people who only stopped at the, at the highest degree. level degree is is one that they earned in our system. Wow. And then what's what's the source of the the income data again? Where did you get that, and how did you cross reference that? Sure. That that is the the quarterly wage records from the state's employment development department. All the employers in the state um, 
send quarterly wage records to EDD, and they basically use it for unemployment insurance verification and compensation. So we could cross-reference the social security numbers with that data? Yes, and, and it, is, it, is an, it is an SSN And not violate match. people's privacy. Yeah. That, that is correct. Member Stark. What an awesome tool. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Perry. This is great. Yeah, this is a great marketing tool for our students um, to be used with our counselors when creating our ed plans. I mean, just to give us information about future goals, period. This is awesome. I mean, I'm blown away. I am blown away <laughs> and, and thoroughly impressed. I think um, if I would had this tool <laughs> when I was making my decisions on educational goals, um, I may have changed and <laughs> did something different. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it, it's a great tool, and it can be used in so many different areas, you know, so not just, you know, for, wow, I'm just speechless. It's great. I'm and so impressed, and I'm really looking forward to seeing um, you move the information forward with tracking those that do transfer, you know, like myself, to see what else happens in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. This is great. Yeah, I, we do think that this is, is a very critical piece of students' choice architecture. Yes, and, very and much And a very so. good use of our data for this. One thing I also wanted to say about the data, the quarterly wage records just state, you know, how much did a student, how much did somebody earn in that particular quarter. Mm -hmm. This does not necessarily mean they are working in that field. Right. It means right. this is just what they made. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, I think there's certain implications that you can make off the data, even as it is. Well, just to speak to that point, um, I've noticed that a lot of counties in California are looking for the AA degree, you know, and the entry fields and the entry positions. So just to know that it's out there and that that is a first step for many of um, the students that are coming out of the system and looking for employment. It, it's exciting, very exciting. Good. Vice President Bob. And I also just think clearly it's a, uh, an analysis that it could be shared readily across the street. And if you want to increase the revenue of the tech, uh, of the, uh, for the Department of Finance of the state of California, you invest in the income uh, earning potential of the students of California. Because uh, hopefully somebody will take that and say, OK, uh, on an aggregate with a two-year degree, um, this, now these people will be earning double or more of what they would have earned otherwise over the course of their work life. And that, uh, that initial investment of two years that they had will generate a significant return on the investment for the state of California. Yeah, so. it, it, I would agree. It, it is the basis of a very good ROI analysis on investment. But wait, there's more. <laughs> So that was the statewide aggregation for all students from all campuses. We also have another one that breaks it down wages by college, by program. Nice. Mm. Nice. Okay. Methodologically here, we have to change things up because uh, you get into some very small ends when you look at you know, one year's worth of graduate in one program by one campus. Mm -hmm. So what we did here to get the ends high enough to track this at a campus level was we measured the median wages for eight years of graduates horizontally, okay? So all graduates in a campus, in a program, for the past eight years, CPI adjusted. And in this case, we're just looking at the plus three award date. It would have been very difficult to do minus two, plus two, plus five in such a complex calculation. So we picked one data point in between here. And... Here is what this one will look like. And there's actually two uses for this. The first one is one can go in at a particular campus. You don't mind me using American River, Bryce? <laughs> we'll pick, you can go in and pick one campus. You can pick one program, or in this case, you could pick all the programs at one campus and all the award types. And what this now tells me is, for all the graduates in American River between 2000 and 2008 in any one particular program or degree, degree type, here's what they were making three years after 
getting that award. Um, notice in this one we also put in the N. Um, this particular program produced 69 graduates over that period of time, and we had an 83% match rate to the wage data to find that. So there are all the programs at American River and their wage outcomes. Or there's another way this can be used. Let's say you are all the nursing faculty getting together across the state. You can select all the colleges and one program. I'll expand this out. I will pick RN and hit go. And now what this tells you is really the regional differences in wage between nurses up and down the state. So if you got your nursing degree um, at Antelope Valley, those 385 people were making a median wage of 64,000. But if you got it in Santa Cruz at Cabrillo, their median wage was 84,000. Now you're getting into local and regional geographical differences of what nurses make up and down the state. Okay? <coughs> those are the two wage marks <coughs> in beta. Likely to be released end of May. You mentioned uh, good for students and counselors, yes. and that was one of the first things we realized. Um, and probably the data mart, as it exists, is probably not the best front end for them. No. Okay, <laughs> we we saw that right off the bat. So we're actually in development now of a more friendly version of that system wide view, and we'll likely call it Salary Searcher. It'll be. A much cleaner format where a student can go in and just type in the name of a program and, and look it up in that manner. That's great. So we think between these two things, scorecard and the wage outcomes, we've created a, a very transparent accountability environment and also mm -hmm. student choice architecture set of tools that uh, nice. should benefit everybody. All right? Any questions? You know, before. Uh, we proceed with any questions. I would like to uh, welcome Mary Hernandez from the governor's office who's joined us this morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, questions? Speak this. You know, th th this is really a, oh, member uh, Belansky. Right. I, don't, I don't have any questions about what was presented per se because it's excellent and it's what we need ways to get a data that we can then use in a variety of ways in the district. But I just want to say again one of the things that's really uh, important to me and that is how we do address the underprepared student who we'd like to make successful, give them the opportunity to be successful and to get into these categories or whatever you want to label them so that they can make a better salary because I think sometimes it might be helpful and I know we don't have the staffing for it and all that to find out what are the best practices going on in our college system uh, to do that and I'll give an example of a reason I say that we had a very uh, enthusiastic mathematics instructor department chair who decides that because students do really poorly at math many times and that it's harder to get through math than it is to get through English, uh, that she would set up a modular program for students to get through remedial math that encompass 16 modules. And then there was the administrative pushback, well, how are we going to put those all in the schedule? And how are you going to get that into financial aid? And I kept saying to her, well, did you check? And she said, I can't <coughs> find. I don't know where to go. I'm using some study from Cornell and trying to come up with my own solution. And sometimes I think if we could find some ways to get people c communicating with one another across the system to say what is working, what isn't working, uh, that would be helpful. Because you can even put out a question on some listserv and you might get two responses. So I, I don't want us to forget that group of students in this process because we need to keep talking about if we're out for student success and the student success scorecard and the rest of it, how do we make more students successful? Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Member Storm. So one more comment, and actually it's a, it's a thank you for your uh, implementation matrix. <laughs> it saved me 
at the uh, CSAC presentation that I had a couple of weeks ago because uh, a question was thrown out about the, uh, the common assessment. You know, when did we s project it to be done or finished or whatever? And I was able to look at the matrix and say, oh, we're working on that. We need more funding, but these are th <laughs> this is what we're this here, is what here. we're using instead, or this is the information that we're looking at until we have the funds to make that happen. So it was extremely useful. So thank you very is, much for providing that information. Is this posted? Yes, it's, it is. It's on the website. Okay. Yes. Well, if I could, I just offer you know clearly. Uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Perry and his team have done a tremendous job in terms oh, of putting meat on the thing. bones but um, of this and, and we're so fortunate to have him on our team. He's, uh, he and his staff uh, did amazing work on this um, and with great involvement of, of system stakeholders, students, faculty, staff, administrators were at the table uh, in, in the planning groups and um, there's an analytic piece, an intellectual piece to this but there's also a political piece to, to, uh, in terms of carrying out this kind of work so that it's meaningful and embraced by the system and I think he's been very successful in leading that. Um, and, and so that's one aspect of the success agenda that you, you adopted was, was this, this scorecard. Um, and you know, uh, I think that it's uh, obviously uh, um, uh, has uh, evolved into a very important uh, feature of, of our system. I think it, it, will, it will be a powerful uh, uh, powerful tool for us as we move move forward. I also wanted to uh, draw attention to a couple other items that will be coming to you in, in future months. Just uh, again to keep track of the whole agenda and where we're at. Uh, we have groups that have worked on um, professional development, um, and so there's some ideas that are, I think, clo close to to completion that will uh, give you more information about those at a future board meeting. Um, in addition, on basic skills, there's a, a document identifying best practices uh, that is, w should be, it's on track for completion in July, uh, presentation at your July meeting. So th there's progress to report on that front as well. Uh, and then we also have groups that are engaged on both uh, uh, the Common Core. Uh, they, they've been meeting recently to uh, ensure that the community colleges have a strong voice as, as California and the nation move towards adoption of a Common Core. Um, so there's important work happening on that sector. I think uh, you, you had a, an a update on that at a recent board meeting, uh, but that work continues. And then lastly, uh, there was a feature in SB 1456 that, that authorized the, um, uh, a minimum academic threshold on the Board of Governors fee waiver. Um, so that, uh, while the legislation authorized that, that, that academic threshold, it will take an action on your part as a board in ter terms of actually defining what that, that threshold for academic eligibility is. Um, and uh, so that's a, another item that, that's forthcoming. So this, this broad uh, success agenda is, it's, I think it's a, a powerful agenda that you've, you've embraced and we as a chancellor's office are, are uh, working on it uh, full speed ahead uh, to put it in place. And I, I think that uh, um, the, the scorecard though is, is worthy of, of stopping for a minute and celebrating because it, it really is uh, quite, a, quite an achievement. Thank you very much to, to both of you. I think that the, the, the scorecard is indeed something that uh, offers transparency as a foundation for a lot of the other work that we do. Uh, I think there's a great temptation to use this information in a comparative way. Uh, I, I, I guess uh, might necessitate reminding us all that California is a very diverse state. There's rural, urban, uh, many very different uh, uh, issues that each of the community colleges confront in terms of their demographics and their student population. Uh, but uh, I think if it's used like the game of golf, you don't compare yourself to Tiger Wood, but to yourself, mm -hmm. I think you'll improve. <coughs> so I think that's an important note to kind of uh, just mention. But, uh, you know, the transparency this, uh, this offers and the, the information that it offers for building successful students is, is very apparent. Thank you both for, for the work and the presentation. Thank you. Member Asumi. Again, I offer my you know, congratulations to Patrick and to Eric and to the rest of the staff. An incredible, incredible achievement. Uh, I just would uh, say that um, uh, I find it helpful to have your slide presentation. You know, it, uh, yeah. it was an excellent presentation, uh, you know, and so I'd love to have it as a resource. Good. Thanks, President.
I expect we'll continue to have this on the agenda for future meetings too, oh, because yeah. uh, we were all in Washington and, and met with uh, Congressman Lowenthal too, and one of the things he asked us as a system is to make sure that we don't let up the foot off the accelerator on the Student Success uh, Task Force uh, uh, reforms that were adopted, and to see each meeting we have something tangible to point to is actually inspiring for me as a, a board member, but I think there's a system and, and, and for us to share outside these walls is great. Thank you both. Uh, I think we'll take a 15-minute uh, break before we get back to the next agenda item.